slim or non-existent or, or you've been in hiding somewhere. His is one of the few introductions to student editions that I actually recommend to my undergraduate students. Uh, that is to his Catedra edition of Perseos Milagros, where even there in that confined prison of horrible paper, um, his prose is witty and light, the argument steadfast and insightful and provocative. His latest book on Celestina, Celestina and the Ends of Desire, won the MLA Catherine Cobbs Prize. And he has a new forthcoming book on the Libro de Buen Amor, uh, entitled Reading, Performing, and Imagining. The Libro de Buen Amor is scheduled to appear next year, to which we are all looking forward to. Uh, Professor Jurley will be speaking on reflections on the long 13th century, curiosity, knowledge, and political power in the Libro de Alexandre. physical map, you know, of what I'm going to talk about today. I also want to thank Ryan Giles, you now sitting back there, who took my mamotreto to 47 pages you know, and cut it down, I hope, to 20 minutes. Now, so if anything is wrong with my paper or you disagree with it, please just, you know, address your comments to Ryan. You know. um, the coordinates of my talk are the long 13th century. Again, now, uh, really the bedrock of this is uh, Charles Homer Haskins, you know, the Renaissance of the 12th century. Uh, but it's been extended, you know, by scholarship in the, what, 75 or 80 years since uh, Haskins book appeared. You know, nearly 100 at this point. See how old I am? Um, it begins with the investiture controversy back in 1085 between uh, Henry IV and uh, Gregory VII, which has to do with the apportionment and the sharing and non-sharing you know, of imperial and ecclesiastical power. Uh, the next, you know, uh, I think important moment is the introduction of Aristotle at the University of Paris and the first prohibitions of Aristotle beginning in 1210 and culminating in 1277 with Bishop Tempier, you know, uh, and the absolute forbidding of Aristotle. He actually was taught at Toulouse, you know, so people could go to Toulouse and learn him. Uh, and the death of Dante, 1340, roughly. You know. uh, the term really, the, or the concept that I'm using here is also by uh, Richard Southern. Now, he never finished the project, but he has two volumes on it, and it's called Scholastic Humanism, you know, and, you know, The Invention of Europe. Um, that's the basics uh, of what I'm going to, you know, base my talk on today. It's clear from the beginning of the Alexandria that the poet sees himself as a member of an intellectual elite, conscious of a debt to pay and a moral obligation to spread learning, uh, since to do so would cause him to fall into wrongdoing, culpa, and to be challenged or admonished and rievto cae for its omission. Yet knowledge and scholarship sustained solely by curiosity, as I hope to show, don't enjoy unfettered freedom in the world of the Libre de Alexandre. They're placed within a clear-cut framework that ties them to political power, imperial ambition, theology, and ideology, and therefore to the need for a principled sense of temperance that invokes the historically tenuous status of curiosity and knowledge dating back to Genesis, Genesis and the fathers of the church, but most importantly and immediately as it were being debated by the scholastics in the context of emergent Aristotelian natural philosophy and the legitimacy of imperial inquiry, empirical inquiry during the late 12th and early 13th centuries. In its extreme form, the new Aristotelian philosophy discounted the authority of scripture and the existence of divine providence, positing a world ruled only by nature, whose secrets could be unlocked by means of methodical first-hand observation governed by dialectical thinking. When examined from this larger European scholastic perspective, the Libro looks out and away from its strictly formal literary context to engage two of the abiding anxieties of 13th century European life and cultural history. Um, the place and validity of knowledge and curiosity in the world and the nature of nascent imperial power in Castile in relation to scientific inquiry and its limits, setting up a conflict between church, state, theology, ethics, and the law. The critical consensus from me and Ian Michael forward regarding Alexander's ruin you know, is neatly reversed by Ivan Corpus, who notes that the overreacher is brought down by God in the, in the, in the end. Man must pay for his sin of pride 
but thinking inkedly as God himself. Natura, the divine agent, takes Alexander to task for his desmesura and meets out his punishment and death. Alexander's desire to conquerir las secretas naturas points to the disclosure of the inscrutable secrets of the natural world, leading to the narrator's observation that Alexander's yearning was such that ni mares ni tierra non lo podían caber, revealing his overweening pride and serving as direct lesson to all seekers of arcane knowledge and aspirants of empire who might fail to balance the pursuit of power and learning with wisdom, self-discipline, and the fear of God. How little has actually been done to place this interpretation of Alexander's portrayal and of evil within the larger European intellectual and cultural milieu that uncovers the broader reaches and foundations of the work's ethical and eschatological posture and its clear relation to secular politics and the rise of Aristotelianism and the new science in the 12th and 13th centuries in the schools. The developing universities, the church, and the Iberian Peninsula. In what follows, I wish to trace the background of this relationship by exploring the uneasy association between knowledge, power, curiosity, and political ambition in the Vigo, while highlighting the work's far-reaching connection with the uh, connection to the intellectual environment of what historians now call scholastic humanism in the long 13th century. Uh, here's a long note, references to uh, Charles Homer Haskins, more recently to Tom Bisson, um, uh, Alexander Murray, and a whole bunch of the studies that have come out in the last 20 years concerning this. Uh, when placed within a, gra a greater European context, it's evident that the Libro reflects an anxiety about knowledge, inquiry, and power, plus an awareness of the larger polemic that was being waged in the schools before, during, and after the time of its composition. In this way, the Libro de Alexander brings to its Castilian vernacular audience a scholarly, ethical, and political problematic that points to its links with the wider cosmopolitan world of the universities. European statecraft and the affairs of the royal court. Although anchored in the historical moment that coincides with the rise of Castilian imperial ambitions, the very politics of empire and the role played by knowledge and power in relation to it reflect the tension that structured the ongoing debate in European learned circles regarding the newly emergent Aristotelian science, the powers of human reason, divine revelation, and the exercise of imperial sovereignty. Contrary to the immediate source, Walter Chatillon's Alexandre's, which was really a school book, I might add, it didn't have to be taken by, 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 by Queen uh, uh, Catalina, no? Um, the Libro de Alexandre, as Ian Michael observes, underscores the fact that Aristotle was Alexander's historical tutor. It stresses that Alexander acquired from the philosopher his curiosity about the world and about nature, and the desire to explore the world and learn. Alexander's talent for and love of formal knowledge is emphasized by the Cassinian poet in a lengthy passage taken from the French Roman d'Alexandre, well, dealing with Duro's youth. Departing markedly from the Alexandres, now the poet takes pain to portray Alexander as the prodigy of 13th century scholastic learning disputation and disputation, reflecting the values of the poet's own contemporary academic world. Aprendí las artes cada día visión de todas cada día facía disputación tanta vía buen ingenio de sutil corazón que venció los maestros a poca de sazón. From the earliest age, Alexander is able to compete in the pursuit of knowledge and learning with all but his master Aristotle. The com his command and pursuit of scholarship is driven by a fundamental inquisitiveness that, in the course of the poem, will be transformed into cupiditas scientia, no, the lust, no, of knowledge that leads him to seek knowledge of the entire universe, even its most arcane and viable secrets. The Cowell Alexander stresses his ambition for conquest and power plus his mastery of Pharisia, while Aristotle seeks to mitigate it with ethical arguments that invoke God and traditional Christian morality, structured on the seven deadly sins, repeatedly admonishing him against all forms of covenants. So, as a quote, I'm sure you all know, I'm not going to read it, it's going to take time. The tension between knowledge, ambition, power, and ethics that shapes the rest of the Cassidian book is thus prefigured in Alexander's encounter with Aristotle from the beginning. While he studied with Aristotle, Alexander focuses on transcending the achievements of all others in pursuit of personal excellence. To realize his goal, he assimilated two principles from his master. One is that power can only become good when put to work for worthy goals. The second principle is that the fundamental goal of life is to achieve knowledge, and hence that life's chief activity is the pursuit of knowledge, which is, in, which is the indisputable foundation of power that sh and it should be freely shared. 
Alexander discovers that questioning the utility of knowledge is foolish, and that knowledge in its purest form is the ultimate good of human achievement. This principle rouses his ravenous desire to know the world and to master all its secrets. Aristotle also conveyed to him the understand, uh, that understanding, what the Greeks called phronesis, was the most powerful possession of all. The human intellect exercised without understanding leads to misapprehension and overweening pride. pride. The poet portrays Alexander's career of conquest as a pursuit of both political power and secular knowledge as he situates his hero in the midst of the debate between philosophers and theologians stemming from the rise of Aristotelianism in the 12th century. There are several key moments in the text that bring it into close contact with 13th century scholasticism and the disputes on Aristotle's science and natural philosophy. In boasting of his mastery of the seven liberal arts, Alexander makes a critical and crucial substitution among them. He replaces mathematics and law with medicine and natural philosophy, reconfiguring the components of the traditional curriculum to emphasize the fullest scrutiny of humankind and his personal methodical interest in the empirical world. Proponents of Aristotelian natural philosophy and the new science were most interested in the natural sciences, of which medicine, studied in conjunction with celestial influences, was born. As he replaces the lower disciplines with these new ones, conspicuously excluding theology, from the list while privileging the empirical sciences, he also emphasizes his mastery of the new logic, or logica nova, based on the text of Aristotle dealing with philosophy, the new science, and its interest in and its interest in understanding and conquering the empirical world. The first of these is Alexander's flight to the Empyrean, drawn by a pair of, if not domesticated, at least methodically controlled flying griffins. The second is the hero's descent into the Red Sea, as he is driven by his curiosity to investigate life among the fishes. The most meaningful part of these episodes comes, from, comes as Alexander takes flight and gazes down from the heavens to see the world below take shape in the image of man. Although a topos, as Francisco Rico has shown, since antiquity, the conceit of the world in the form of a man is given new purpose here um, as it plays on another well-known medieval topos, Imago Dei, which highlights the symbolic relationship between humanity and God. As Alexander looks down from above, he usurps no, the perspective of God and does nothing less than appropriate God's privileged perspective on the world below. Um, and, and the man he had created in his own image. Okay, this image in the context of Alexander's two expeditions or experiments, for want of a better name, are the spark and, in, and the indi they spark the indignation of nature, who hurries before her creator, the Almighty, to denounce Alexander for invading her kingdom. Now, Aggrieved by the trespass, the poet is careful to register you know, God's angry reaction. They saw the creador que creó la tura, o poder a Chandra, Sanya Gran Rentura, dicho este lunático que no encarta la mesura, yo tocaré el gozo, toda la madura. There's an irony here, it's the first time the word lunático appears in Spanish and it belongs to medical discourse. Natura then journeys to hell to confirm with Lucifer. <coughs> Like all mortals, Alexander's death is prepared by nature, but not before consulting the two higher authorities, God and Lucifer, placing, its, placing events in a metaphysical eschatological framework absent from the Alexandria <coughs> that stresses the existence of a providence beyond nature actively interested in human affairs. To be sure as it invokes Lucifer's role in the equation, it establishes a moral symmetry between him and Alexander, since Lucifer was the first victim of his own pride and curiosity God. Now, Bernard Clairvaux understood this very well when he commented that Lucifer was the first to seek to know the extent of divine tolerance, but never foresaw the consequences. Lucifer's primordial curiosity is thus deemed the sin of sins, born as it were before time, before Adam, before Eve, and continues to provoke humankind to stray from the path of righteousness in the orthodox 12th and 13th century Christian imagination. Bernard's conclusion regarding Lucifer is succinct. He fell from heaven because, driven by curiosity, he tested something forbidden that he arrogantly desired. Spectavit curiosae, affectavit illicite, speravit presumptuos. Like Lucifer himself, the poet tells us, Alexander overestimated divine forbearance, blinded by his inquisitiveness and an illusion of his own omnipotence. In this way, Natura's petitioning of God marks yet another meaningful departure from Walter's Alexandreus, just as it affirms Natura's subjugation to the deity who created him. In philosophy, a God made Natura Naturata, as opposed to a limitless 
self-governing Natura-Nantunans, explicitly countering the Aristotelian belief that the world was ruled solely by the forces of an autonomous Natura. The poet thus announces God's condemnation and Alexander's pride and absence of self-knowledge, dooming him to suffer the very same judgment Alexander had passed on the fishes. In God's censure of Alexander's pride, there can be no doubt that the poet's departure from the Alexandreus constitutes a reproof of Alexander's arrogance stemming from his desire to penetrate, scrutinize, and master the mystery of the Almighty's natural world. Although these events have rightly been seen to affine the Alexander with Christian orthodoxy, constituting the conclusive cause and essence of Alexander's fall, mutatis mutandis, it appears more than significant that Alexander's trespass is couched in terms of the violation of nature by a spirit of empirical inquiry, which could not help but evoke the polemic regarding the Aristotelian natural philosophy and the ethical limits of human reason. In short, the intellectual portrait that emerges of Alexander in the Libra is one which exposes his worldly spirit of inquiry as the antithesis of Christian orthodoxy, linking him to the theological center of curiosity that lay at the center of the reaction to the rise of the new science and Aristotelian natural philosophy in European academic circles during the 15th century. The poet's interpolations drawn from sources other than Walter are significant then, since they unmistakably identify Alexander not just as Aristotle's celebrated disciple, but as a committed partisan and practitioner of Aristotelianism and the new learning, just when the philosopher's writings were being openly debated and at a time when his methods were threatening theology, causing sufficient alarm amidst traditional theologians to lead to the prohibition of Aristotle teaching for heterodoxy in a series of prescriptions uh, of his thought that stretched the length of the 13th century, now, especially in, in, in Paris. Yeah. To preserve its preeminence in the 13th century, revealed truth had to keep philosophy at bay, subordinate to itself, portraying it and its methods as mere servants of theology. Since disinterested rational inquiry, the bedrock of natural science was itself unable to afford any viable way toward a better understanding of the, ten, uh, the tenets of the faith or the mysteries of creation. In short, the prevailing view was that it was both unwise and impossible to scrutinize, let alone predict, the divine nature of creation by means of observation, ratiocination, or calculation. What might seem inevitable and contrary from the perspective of human reason was not necessarily inevitable or impossible from the perspective of God's omnipotence. Consequently, the orthodox position maintained in philosophical deduction remained useless and could easily become a form of sinful arrogance. With respect to theological understanding, unless it was totally subjugated and subordinated to revealed doctrine. With God, while dialectics and natural philosophy could help to a point, the teachings of faith and dogma never could be submitted to them. Because of this, heresy in particular was believed to be the child of philosophy, as it emerged from philosophical methods, concepts, etc. As Willis, as Willis observed long ago, no, the Libro is much more than a sort of translation of the main source. The author made his selections from these sources intelligently and added material from sources of widely divergent character with a view to attaining a homogeneous and coherent narrative. Unmistakably, the Alexandre poet drew on meaningful texts and for material that accentuated what he perceived to be most at stake in his characterization of the era, namely the limits of natural philosophy, curiosity, and rational inquiry vis-a-vis -vis the superior authority and wisdom of, super, of a supernatural God. In addition to its scholarship, eschatological design, the moral symmetry of the Libra is clear. Alexander's fall by his own unbridled, satisfied curiosity is ominously configured numerous times in the text. Now, his own men complain about it. The Scythian you know, foreshadows it, etc., etc. The most comprehensive analysis of curiosity amongst the fathers was produced by Augustine. In the Confessions, he sets out you know, its phenomenology. And he says that it's a work when people study the operations of nature which lies beyond our grasp, when there is no advantage in knowing and the investigators simply desire knowledge for its own sake. Now, and I'm going to jump ahead. Almost exactly, you know, contemporary to the com composition of the Libre de Alexandre, the effect and importance of Aristotle's reintroduction into Western thought is difficult to overstate. With the rise of dialectic in the schools and in the 12th century, a new analytical method emerged for, for, school, for scholars to use. At the same time, translations arriving from Toledo and Cordoba provided them with a model of application and a guide for further exploration. The conjunction of these events in the context of early university culture, 
but especially at Paris and Oxford, created a century of political unrest among European intellectuals as they inter interrogated traditional teachings using the tools of the new line, created both by theory and direct observation. This questioning often led to accusations of heresy, as in the notorious cases of Siger de Brabant, Boethius of Dacia, etc., etc. In the Iberian Peninsula, things took a dramatic turn. During the 12th and 13th centuries, Toledo was the center for the translation and transmission of Greek philosophy, as well as other disciplines as mediated by the Muslim world. It was via the translations undertaken at Toledo by scholars like Gerardo Cremona, you know, and the ones that uh, Amaya showed, you know, the Aristotle, uh, that Aristotle first found his way to Paris. However, Angel Martinez Casado, you know, who works in philosophy, reveals a striking polemical work by Lucas Etuli that cultural historians know have virtually ignored or fail to appreciate in terms of its relevance to 13th century Iberian intellectual history. Lucas says, De altera vita fideque controversis, composed circa 1237, which is almost at the exact time you know, of the Libre de Rechami, focuses on scholars who delight in calling themselves natural philosophers, he, philosophorum seu naturalium gloriantum. These thinkers, Lucas says, judge the fathers of the church to be idiotas and When compared to Plato and Aristotle, they fail to believe in divine providence and remain certain that the world is guided only by natura in the absence of an engaged deity. They assert that omnia inferiora is moved only by the planets, never secundum voluntatem divina. Scripture for them is nothing more than a collection of vague allegories to be read through the rational lens of philosophy. Anticipating many of the propositions that which ultimately inspired the prohibitions of Tim Pierre at Paris in the 1270s, they rejected the creative world and the existence of a soul independent of the body. Lucas and the churchmen clustered around him at Leon were, according to Martinez de Casado, an autochthonous breed, inhabitants of an intellectual island in a rapidly changing scholarly universe. Their type of insulated, reactionary thinking arose as a response to the presence of Aristotle and natural philosophy at Court, No, and Leon and Castile, which had arrived there via the University of Valencia and the diffusion of scholastic learning to it during the first part of the 15th century. Adeline Bertois has also confirmed that we should not be surprised you know, to find you know, a school of natural philosophy in 13th century Castile. On the likely connection of Alexander to the University of Paris, that, uh, Valencia, you know, there, there's a lot of evidence. Okay. The new science, plus negative assessments and denunciations of Aristotle, Aristotelian natural philosophy, politics and curiosity, thus form part of the immediate intellectual horizon to the new Edition. When we survey the state of natural philosophy, theology, and literature during the long 13th century, it becomes clear that intellectuals across Europe were broadly divided into two irreconcilable, equally influential ways of conceiving knowledge and power, one philosophical and the other theological or ascetic to one of the better words. During this extraordinarily creative period, the interaction between theology and philosophy also led to the formation and cultivation of potent, flexible, civic and, cult civic and cultural institutions. They, uh, based on the point of adequate knowledge, is to move away from divine wisdom and be guilty of radicalisms. According to Bonaventure, you know, who proposed just at the time the Alexander was being written, you know, and he says that amidst the world, no, amidst, I'm oh, cutting out here, now, amidst the world of washing Aristotelianism, Bonaventure saw the need to re-energize the old debate regarding human curiosity, arguing that God had provided humanity with as much knowledge as it needed to join together and live by its Christian life. Now, uh, I'll spare you the quote from Bonaventure. Exactly at the time the Libra de Ashanti was being composed, the Emperor Frederick II, cousin to Alfonso X at Savio, and stupor mundi vir inquisitor et sapientia amator, as he probably calls himself, in the prologue to De Arte Veranicum Avibus, strive you know, to find the naked truth, to demonstrate things as they are, manifestare ea que sunt, sicut sunt. This, as we know, was the ordering principle of Frederick's civic vision, as well as a crucial part of his great European cultural project. It led Nietzsche in the 19th century to call him the first European. But it was also the main reason why Dante places a twice excommunicated emperor in hell among the heretics. Uh, despite his praise for Frederick in the Monarchia and the Vulgari Eloquente. Likewise, you know, the Franciscan Salim Benet de Aram, one of Frederick's contemporaries and notable frenemies, now, along with many of his fellow 
fellow clerks condemned Frederick's secular enterprise as a, as a whole, noting that the emperor's false experimenta, superstitiones e curiositates e maledicciones e incredulitates e perversitates e abusiones led him and his followers to nothing less than Epicureanism, the code word for free thinking pagan materialism. Like Dante, Salimbene saw Frederick's secularism in science and politics as an anathema. And my proposition here is that the Alexandre is also you know, a way of viewing empire you know, through this distorted, archaic lens of the Roman Antique. Since the events leading up to Henry IV and Pope Gregory VII at Canossa in 1077, politics, the church, and the exercise of power, especially universal transcultural imperial power, have been one of the dominant themes of medieval intellectual life. <coughs> Uh, the, invention, the, inve the investiture controversy, as Norman, uh, Norman Cantor says, had shattered the early medieval equilibrium and ended the interpretation of Ecclesia and Mundo, an interpenetration of Ecclesia and Mundus. Medieval kingship, which had been largely the creation of ecclesiastical ideas and personnel, was forced to develop the institutions and some of its sanctions. Um, in the Anishanda, it's very much to the poet's credit that we see something far larger than our Roman antique. We find in it the stirrings of political philosophy linked to a meditation and admonition on secular power, which captures a moment when power was changing from something principally affected into something worldly and institutionalized, where the talk of the state was still anachronistic, even if glimmers of state-like behavior began to appear in the late 12th century, but with the key phenomenon of power had become lordship. The Alexandre harbors a preoccupation with lordship and an emerging sense of public affairs, res publica, not unlike, not, like, not unlike that discernible in John of Salisbury, as it confronts the central and lasting importance of secular sovereignty in Western Europe, the ungovernmental character of many medieval polities, and the significance of the emergence of what was rapidly becoming not a political society, but at least a society with politics. In the end, the Alexander poet, via his fable, proposes about the construction of a reformed imperial autoritas one that envisions a broad cultural purview that justifies and stabilizes the nature and uses of power based on knowledge in the secular world, but also one necessarily mitigated by personal virtue and humility before the mysteries of creation. Although it would be an overstatement you know, to call the poet reactionary in his anti-Aristotelian propensities, since he does not espouse a spirituality or a politics that favors an unquestioning return to the status quo ante, the previous spiritual and political order of society he does not fully accept the completely lay politics, philosophy, or political philosophy, even, if he's, even as he does not propagate a nostalgia for something absent in his portrayal in Alexander's pagan society. The Libro seeks to advance both a model of knowledge and a norm for its civic use, as it builds upon the ancient Christian taboos of self-sufficient knowledge and bona curiositas to construct a scheme in which knowledge can be legitimated but only insofar as it might serve God in a higher moral, moral order. In his Apologia of Knowledge, the poet thus also reveals its dangers and ambiguities, especially when it's in, 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 it is in and manipulated by the hands of power. In the Alexandre, knowledge, education, and wisdom are guiding forces, no? et cetera. And the poet's vision is held together by his particular organization of many things, but I have no more room for time, so I will skip pages ahead. The main thrust of the Alexandre points to a desire both to encourage and regulate secular power, but most especially imperial power, you know, just as absolutism was emerging throughout Europe, characterized by an, end, uh, an ending of feudalism, a consolidation of authority, and an absolute sovereign, the appearance of elaborate state apparatuses, the establishment of professional standing armies, the codification of statewide laws, and the rise of ideologies that justify all of these things. Um, the Alexander's composition in the vernacular is also very significant. You know, it's meant to be you know, read and understood by many. Uh, and let's get to the end here. Um, at the end, the poet raises the specter of a proud tyrant, unaware of superior authority. And this particular point, we're not actually far away you know, from John of Salisbury's uh, Polycratic. You know, I think that you, know, you could read profitably Alexander's death you know, in light of John of Salisbury. When viewed from this perspective, we're not far from that. For his metallurgic knowledge is also very instructive in the politics of knowledge in Paris in the 19th century. Um, Babylon, the scene of Alexander's death, is traditionally recognized 
as a symbol of humanity's overweening pride. Alexander's throne, placed there in the central plaza, is evocative of materialism, sensuality, pride, and godlessness, just as it is raised over the site of another blasphemous structure which figures pretty prominently in Judeo Christendom's most familiar parable of human presumptuous power of God. Um, the poet stresses that Alexander arranges his throne on an elevated mound, an alto poyat, traditionally taken as the, the vestiges of the Tower of Babel that lay just off the main square of the city. That edifice, whose original name meant gate of God, is virtually synonymous with human arrogance and folly. A fittingly ironic place for the Lord of all the world to hold his counsel just prior to meeting his end, knelt at the hands of the traitor. Babylon and the Tower of Babel, said to have been erected in the central square of Babylon, share the symbolism of the sacred center. In the Negro, Alexander's throne, thus sits ironically at the center no, of the gate of God, and is directly implicated in the reedification of the Tower of Babylon. Viewed from a broader European perspective, it's clear that this R. W. Southern's lament of the unfinished study and the unifying role played by scholastic humanism maintained. Scholasticism was to bear a major influence on all Western culture, significantly beyond the confines of universities. Throughout Europe during the long 13th century, scholars and school-educated men moved out of the universities and the studia to carry out important roles in government and the church. As they labored, no in mundo, in agone, in lucta, that's from Diego Garcia de Campos, no, planeta, no, they sought not just to influence a spiritual life of humankind, but to shape its political and social destiny as well. Like the later humanists in the 15th and 16th centuries, the Alexander poet had no trouble appealing to classical pagan figures and ideas alongside the pious arguments that found their origins in the fathers of the church doctrine. The scholastic humanism of the author of the Negro of the Alexandre is religious and spiritual, but also in direct opposition to any kind of asceticism or spirituality that flatly turns back upon the world. It recognizes the human ability to attain knowledge and achievement in life through active engagement in human affairs, so long as humanity remains cognizant of a higher moral realm and responsibility. What Southern calls scholastic humanism is pious and religious, but also in opposition to any kind of asceticism it recognizes humanity's ability both to attain knowledge and to have influence in life through active political engagement, while stressing righteous ends and the existence of metaphysical realities to which humanity remains responsible. To say this is to move beyond mere formalism and to begin to understand, too, the role played by knowledge in the Libra of Alexandria and the poet's own words and use of it, and the deeper resonances of his words that mestet es sin pecado, that is to say, it is a ministerium without sin. 